So now that we've talked about setting up hypotheses and kind of the understanding of what we're trying to do with inferential statistics, now I want to help you learn how we define whether something is different or the same. And the other thing I'm going to say is that we're, what I'm giving you here is how we define what I call the rejection region or the idea that it's in a region of difference. And so if we, let's start with the two-tailed test here. We have this nice blue distribution and we wanna see if your score is in here where everyone else is, or if you're in this red zone, which would suggest to us that you might be more likely coming from a different distribution. Now remember, we have defined that the middle blue zone is 95%. That leaves a leftover 5%. And so we're gonna to have to split that evenly. So we have two and a half percent on either side. And now what I want to know is what the z-score is that's associated with this 2.5% because then I know if you have a z-score higher than this line, that means you're in this red zone and I can conclude you're not like everyone else. Or if it's over here, if you have a z-score less than this line, then you're in the red zone and you're not like everyone else. So I need to find what the z-score is associated with the line between the blue and the red here. And we know how to do that, right? We've got to know the distribution and I would be able to give you a percentage and then you went and looked it up in the table. And so we're going to do that now. So let me go um, pull up my table so we can see. Um, well, let's see, we can see what the z-score is associated with that. So here's the z table. And so just to remind you, what we're doing is we're looking up two and a half percent in the c column. Because remember, that's the one that's on the end. And so this, this table is not in percents, but it's in proportion. So instead of looking up two and a half percent, we're going to look up a 0 0.025. And that's going to tell us what z-score we need. So I'm scrolling. I see a 0 0.01. That's not what I need. I come over here. I see a 0 0.027. That's close, but not quite. Now I see 0 0.025, that's exactly what I wanted. So it's a C column of two and a half percent and I find that that score is 1.96. So let's go ahead and put that in our picture so we can see how it looks. So we can see that um, we looked up our Z score is 1.96. So that means that this line here is 1.96. So Z scores above 1.96 would be in the abnormal zone. Because it's a symmetrical distribution, then we also know that this score over here is negative 1.96. So any scores below negative 1.96 would be in an abnormal zone. So let's say we have Bob's score. Let's say these are intelligence scores and Bob has a score up here, maybe 2.5. So you can see how if Bob's score is up here, he seems to be different from everyone else. It's more likely that Bob is coming from a distribution of smart people than he is coming from the blue distribution of normal people. So if I had set up my null and alternative to look like this, I wanted to know if Bob was the same as Mew or Bob was different from the Mew. If Bob's score is in this red zone, then clearly the null hypothesis is wrong. If the null hypothesis is wrong, then we want to make a decision about the null hypothesis that reflects that. So remember, we always assume the null hypothesis to be true. So I'm going to make all of my decisions about the null. And so in this case, if we find that Bob's score is in the red zone, I'm going to cross off the null hypothesis, and then my formal decision is that I reject the null. Now, I understand that rejecting the null is not uh, maybe a phrase you would have used. You might have said the null is wrong, but we're being very selective with our words so that we make sure we're really clear on what we're doing. And what we have done is we've rejected the notion that the null is true. So we're just going to reject it. But I still have to make a conclusion. I can't just go around saying, I rejected the null today. I have to make a final statement about Bob. Now, you might see that the alternative hypothesis says Bob is not the same as Mu. But that isn't necessarily a good conclusion. And I like to tell my students to think of their grandma. Um, whenever I did a study, my grandma was always interested in what I was doing, right? And so I would call her up and tell her what I did. Now, if I called my grandma and said, hey, grandma, I rejected the null, my grandma would say, who's the null and why'd you reject them? That's so mean. I taught you better than that. And then if I said, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. What I meant to say is Bob is different from everyone else. My grandma would want to know, well, how is Bob different? right? So she's always following up with good questions. And so when you're thinking about telling your grandma what you did, you can't just say Bob is different. You have to get really specific about what you found. And because you found Bob's score to be in that upper red zone, then you're safe to conclude that Bob scores higher. 
or Bob has a higher IQ. So it's really important that you make your conclusions um, very specific, even though the hypothesis might have been very general, the conclusion has to be specific because you want to do something that works for people to understand. Well, let's say that we were um, kind of doing this again, and I want to remind you that we always assume the null hypothesis to be true. That's kind of our, our starting spot. But let's say Bob's score was in here. So let's say his score is like a 1.0. We are going to assume the null hypothesis to be true, and now I do not have enough evidence to cross it off. Now, I'm not going to really cross off the alternative, because again, I don't really know. Bob might be different. I mean, he's sort of close to that line. He seems to be a little higher than everyone else. It's kind of like saying guilty and not guilty. I'm not really sure I can cross off the alternative. All I know is I do not have enough evidence to cross off the null. So what we end up saying in that case, where we don't have enough evidence to cross off the null, is that we failed to reject the null. So our two conclusions statistically are reject the null or fail to reject the null. If we fail to reject the null, it just means we didn't find enough evidence to reject it. So if I fail to reject the null, then my final conclusion is that Bob does not score higher. Right? I don't have the ability, ability to say he was higher. Now, sometimes students go, well, but look, he was different from the mean. The mean is in here, and clearly his score was different. We do not acknowledge differences unless they are statistically different. And statistically different means they were in the red zone. So even though Bob's score may be higher than the mean, you do not say he has a different score. So sometimes students will try to say, well, Bob was a little higher than the mean, but it wasn't you know, in the rejection region. That is not an appropriate conclusion. Anything in the blue zone, we say Bob is not different from everyone else. Even though he might look different, he's kind of on the higher end, you can only conclude statistically that he's not different. The only time that changes is when Bob finds himself in the red zone, and then you can be more specific about the differences. Now let's think about how this would look if we were doing a one-tail test. So here, let's say that um, we had significant research about Bob um, and we, we were justified in doing a one-tail test. So we were trying to see if Bob was significantly higher than the rest of the population. So our null would be that he's less than or equal to the rest of the population. And the process is very similar, except instead of having 1.96 as my rejection region, remember that was associated with the 2.5%, I now have to look up what percent um, would be here. And so remember, we have 95% in the normal zone and a 5% abnormal zone, but now the 5% is all on one side. So now we have to look up a new z-score uh, in the table to see what z-score is associated with this new line, because the, the red zone's bigger now. So let's go ahead and look that up. So now I want to look up in the C column 5%, which would be a proportion of 0.05. So I'm going to scroll through the distribution here, and I'm finding there's a 0 0.003, so that's not right. I might have to go up here. And now I'm getting closer. Here's 0 0.0505 and here's 0 0.0495. So you'll notice that these are both equal distant away from 0 0.05. I don't have exactly 0 0.05. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the higher z-score because both of them are around the same uh, distance to 0 0.05. But if we take the higher z-score, what we are doing is making it harder on us as researchers um, to find that a score is in the rejection region. Do you see how it would be a smidge bit easier to find a 164 than it would be to find a 165? So if we make it harder on ourselves as a researcher, we're doing good science. So we're going to choose 1.65. Now let's go put that in our picture. So now we know that this, for a one-tailed test, is the, the cutoff to be in that red zone is 1.65. Now I call it a red zone, but I also like to call it a rejection region because it helps me remember that I'm going to reject the null if you fall in that red zone. So let's say that Bob's score is here. He's clearly in the rejection region or he's in the red zone. So I'm going to cross off the null because it isn't uh, possible to be true. And I'm going to reject the null. Now, when I reject the null, I have to call grandma and tell her what I found, and I can say that I found that Bob scores higher than um, other people. 
Now, the same thing we did with the two-tailed test would work if Bob's score fell in the middle here, then I would fail to reject the null and conclude that Bob is um, the same as or less than everyone, or I would like probably just conclude Bob is not higher than everyone else, something that would be clear for grandma. But what we can see that we've just done to kind of wrap up is that we found um, a way to define those regions that would be considered different, and I call them rejection regions because we're going to reject the null if somebody's score falls in them. And you'll notice if it's two-tailed test, it's 1.96 and negative 1.96. If it's a one-tailed test, it'd be a 1.65. If it was a one-tailed test on the lower um, tail, it'd be a negative 1.65. Um, but they can't be negative 1.65 and 1.65 at the same time, right? It'd be, so we have three scenarios. 1.96 and negative 1.96 would be scenario one. Scenario two would be 1.65, and then scenario three would be negative 1.65. And so all of that work we learned to uh, understand the distribution, it's going to come down to just those three numbers. Um, so 1.96 and 1.65 are the negatives of those. Those are going to be the scores we're going to use to define these rejection regions moving forward.